So it's capital budgeting. It's the process of selecting from among usually a range of different investment programs. Because most businesses don't think this is the one thing I'm going to invest in. Even if it's a single product company, they'll think, oh, do I build a factory here or do you build a factory over there? What model do I develop? Or many companies, of course, think of a range of different things they might invest in. Or do I build it or lease it from somebody else? Right? And the idea is that we want to maximize the market value of the firm. Now, that ultimately, that means making the ownership of the company more valuable, but generally that comes about from making the company more valuable. But we're not yet focused on valuing companies. We're going to focus for the rest of today and maybe the beginning of tomorrow is selecting among investments, deciding whether we should or shouldn't make an investment. Or if there's a number of different investment alternatives, which of the ones do we want to pursue and which of the ones will we say, no, don't want to make that investment. What I have here is a very simplified balance sheet, and most companies are generating operating revenues, and they may be making distributions to shareholders. In fact, well, uh, I've got no, both dividends and buybacks. It's very hard to figure out how you ought to work buybacks, and in fact, I'll talk about some of the ways that they try to reflect that, because if all we're looking at are the dividends, you're missing a lot of money that's going to shareholders in many cases. Apple spends a lot more money on buybacks than they pay out as dividends every year, as a matter of fact. But then how is the company financing its business? Are they financing with debt or equity? Or for that matter, are they paying off debt and reducing the amount of debt they have uh, outstanding? So we're going to focus on investments that generate revenues today, but then on Tomorrow and Wednesday, uh, we'll, we'll spend time dealing with these issues as well, dividend distributions and share buybacks and how we're funding the business. But for now, let's focus on the investing decision. Now, this is a common mistake. I'm not saying you're guilty of it, but in general, I see people make this mistake very often. What we want to do when we're valuing investments is value them on an opportunity cost of capital, as you said earlier, that reflects the risk of that project. So now I'm not looking at this as just use value of the money. We're considering investing in this project uh, is a project that I think will generate a 12% return automatically better than a project that will generate a 9% return. Well, no, it depends on the risk of the two projects. If the 12% project is very risky and the 9% project is very safe, Maybe it's better to make a safe 9% than hope to make 12, but maybe do dramatically worse. So you always want to use an opportunity cost of capital when you're doing a net present value analysis. Note, an internal rate of return, you're not using an opportunity cost of capital. This is specific to net present value analysis, which I would say is the right way to approach things as I'll share with you when we come across it, it's not the way most companies do capital budgeting. Most companies use internal rate of return. But I'll, I'll share with you the results of a number of surveys I've read later on. But I think that's wrong. I think that adjusting the value of cash flows for the risk is the most appropriate way to value projects, even though a majority of companies don't use that approach. And I'll talk about why they don't. I'll try to put a context on these things. And note what the opportunity cost of capital is. We said it, but basically it's what could have been earned on an equivalent risk investment. So you're not just going to make a number up. You're going to look at what is the common rate of return on projects of that sort. So if I'm valuing a gold mining operation, what's a typical rate of return on gold mining operations? On the other hand, if I'm looking at an airplane leasing program, I'm going to look at what's a typical rate of return on, on airplane leasing. The same company will oftentimes use different opportunity cost of capital for different types of projects. I'd mentioned Intel earlier, and the, the example is mentioned later in the outline, but it is appropriate to talk about it here. I think Intel has since sold off the business, but some number of years ago, they bought a software company uh, by the name of McAfee. And they made 
uh, uh, software to protect from viruses and from uh, hacking and things like that. And I think Intel sold that business earlier this year, or last year, I should say. But when Intel was looking at investment projects, did they use the same opportunity cost of capital when they were thinking about investing in chip factory versus investing in software? No, the risk of those two are very different. They used a much lower opportunity cost of capital when they were valuing software investment than they were when they were looking at chip producing investment. And that's appropriate because the risk of the two activities is not at all the same. And this is a very common mistake. I, I, was, uh, I saw a presentation. In fact, if you want something to follow up this class, there's a professor at the NYU uh, who puts all of his classes online. He's an Indian gentleman. Oh, I, he, I, he might have been born in the United States or he came over to the United States when he was very young because he doesn't have too thick of an Indian accent. Uh, I forget his first name, but Damodaran. And he has, he's a very well-known professor at NYU, and he, puts, he, he does corporate finance classes, valuation classes. And so I was watching a, a video. You can get it on YouTube for free. So these are all free classes. And he was talking about doing some consulting work for General Electric, you know, GE, big U.S. company. And so he, after he was doing a presentation to them on you know, valuation, and he was talking about opportunity cost of capital. So, so what, is, what do you, as the GE managers, what do you use when you're valuing companies? Oh, they said, we all use WAC. <laughs> Weighted average cost of capital. Well, note, GE would have a very low WAC, especially at the time, back in the 90s, when it was a very big, successful company. So in other words, they were using too low of an interest rate when valuing all these investments they were thinking about making. So it's very important to use an interest rate that reflects the risk of the investment. And again, how do you come up with that? Because it's not always easy. You know, because you know, what you're looking for ideally is similar projects and similar situations. But you know, sometimes it's hard to find something exactly the same. So you look for real world examples as close as possible to the project you're investing in, and then maybe adjust the number up or down to reflect the unique circumstances you're in. But I mean, just to give you a real world example, in the US, the typical return on investing in restaurants is like 20 some percent, 20, 22 percent. Does that mean I should always use an opportunity cost of capital of 20% if I decide to uh, go into the restaurant business? Well, no, if I'm opening a McDonald's, it's a franchise. Everybody knows McDonald's. They're nearly all successful. That would mean a much lower opportunity cost of capital than if I'm opening up a new restaurant that I, you know, I, I don't have the network effects of everyone knowing about McDonald's and travelers coming into my area, even though they don't know me, they know McDonald's, so they'll come to my McDonald's. If I'm opening a new store where it's I'm the, not a chain, it's the only restaurant, and maybe I'm you know, gonna sell, uh, I don't know, Thai cuisine or something like that. Now I should pick something more obscure. There's lots of Thai restaurants in the United States. But the point is that very different. You know, if I'm opening up my own restaurant as opposed to opening up a franchise of a successful uh, international company. So they're both in the restaurant business, but they would mean very different opportunity cost of capital for my standalone restaurant versus opening up a franchise of a successful chain. Yeah. 